a series called uh, There's a First Time for Everything. And uh, in Christmas, uh, Christmas 1999, I know it's October, sorry to talk about Christmas already, but Christmas 1999, I was a mere 10 years old, yet yeah, let it sink into you, I was 10 years old, 1999, and uh, I had, uh, just before my 10th birthday, I'd started attending church, my neighbors, I'm not from a Christian family or from a church family, and my neighbors had started going along to church and had invited me to go with them. And so on my Christmas list that year uh, was a Bible. I'd asked for a Bible for Christmas. My parents thought, what on earth has happened to our son? What kind of crazy cult group has he joined that on the top of his present list is a Bible? But anyway, I asked for a Bible and I was given this very Bible here, the New Century Version Holy Bible International Children's Bible. And I don't know whether you do this, but a top tip for your kids, if uh, when we were children, uh, we were given a bag of presents at the end of our bed. So when we woke up at 3.30 or 4 a.m. or whatever time it was, so excited about the presents we were going to get, we would find there a, a, a sack of presents that we could begin opening and playing with. And often they were Lego and intricate things that would keep us busy uh, for at least three or four hours before we went through and woke up my, our parents. And so in my sack that year was this Bible. It was the first thing I opened. I suspected it might be what I'd asked for. And sure enough, it was. And I remember I opened up this Bible and began reading it. And I don't know exactly where I started reading, whether it was the book of Matthew. I thought, oh, I'll read the Christmas story and turn to Matthew and started reading there or one of the Old Testament passages. But I remember what I encountered was a list, a list of names, a list of places, and it seemed to go on and on and on. And I'm quite an optimistic kind of person. So I ran through to my parents' bedroom uh, when it was time, and they said that we could go through. And I remember taking my Bible and saying, you got me the best Bible that you could get me. This International Children's Bible, New Century Version, is the best Bible because it has these lists. And you don't just find out about the person, but you know who their parent was and who their grandparent was and who their great grandparent. And it goes on and on. I think this is the best Bible because it gives me all these lists and lets us know about all of these people. I know, what kind of 10 year old was I? Uh, <laughs> But so uh, they thought, okay, well, well done you. And this, this morning, uh, we are in a section of the Bible that has lists after lists after lists. And if you're unfamiliar with the Bible, let me tell you, it's an incredible book. And there is some incredible truth. Uh, but sometimes you have to work harder than at other times to take out the truth. Because there's history books in there. And the writers of the Bible were trying to tell us something about history. And so we've, we've been looking in this series on Joshua, the book of Joshua. And Joshua is an exciting book to a point, and you reach a chapter where it starts to get heavy. It's those bits of the Bible, those of you that read a Bible plan like I do, I try to read through the Bible every single year, and so I don't get to just read the nice books that I wanna read, but I have to go through some of the books that are less exciting, and you get to these lists, and you think, brilliant, that's my three chapters done, I'll just skip over that, because I'm not gonna get anything from all of these names and all these countries that are contained uh, within the list. And uh, where we are today is in, in Joshua, the, there's nine chapters of lists, nine chapters of lists, and we're not going to read all of those nine chapters, uh, but it's a kind of, it's a funny place and, uh, in, in the book. It's such an exciting book. We've, we're recording these seven years where Joshua becomes a leader of the people of Israel, and they go and take their land. They, they, they in conquest, they're, they're in battle. There's some exciting things that happen. There's a moment where uh, they walk around the walls of a city, and they do a cheer, and the, the walls fall down. There's a moment where God comes to the leader, Joshua, and says, all of my heaven's armies are yours so, for the winning of this battle. There's a moment where uh, a, uh, the sun itself stops still so that they can win these battles and so many exciting things that happen and and it starts where they they go around all the kings and defeat king after king after king and then begins the list and it starts by describing the name of the king and then it says one and then the next king one and then the next king one and so the list begins. then then after that uh, it then begins to outline in the heading of, of my bible is the division of the land or the allotment to the tribes and it's this moment where each tribe is given some land and you know that in this church we, we have a team that preaches and we we split up the the titles and it often feels like i get the short end of the stick and so here i got given 
these nine chapters to talk about the allotment of the land and how exciting that would be. Uh, so what we're going to do is just read a few verses just to kind of intro us into this section of the Bible. So we're in Joshua 13. Uh, so if you want to turn there, Joshua 13, and we're going to read the first seven verses there. Uh, get ready for some names that you've never heard before. Um, Joshua 13, verse 1. It says this, When Joshua had grown old, the Lord said to him, You are now very old, and there are still very large areas of land to be taken over. Deep breath. This is the land that remains. All the regions of the Philistines and the Gershurites, from the river Shehor on the east of Egypt to the territory of Ekron on the north, all of it counted as Canaanite, though held by the five Philistine rulers in Gaza, Ashdod, Ashkelon, Gath, and Ekron, the territory of the Avites. I know. Just bear with me. On the south, all the land of the Canaanites from Ara of the Sidonians as far as Aphek and the border of the Amorites, the area of Byblos and the Lebanon to the east, from Gal, uh, Baal Gad below Mount Hermon to Lebo Hamath. As far as all the inhabitants of the mountain regions, from Lebanon to Misferoth, Maim, that is all the Sidonians. I myself will drive them out before the Israelites. Be sure to allocate this land to Israel for an inheritance, as I have instructed you, and divide it as an inheritance among the nine tribes and the half-tribe of Manasseh. It's heavy stuff, isn't it? And it goes on and on and on and on for nine chapters, just like that. Exciting stuff. But what we're going to do, hopefully, is unpack some truth from this that is going to help us and be, we'll be able to uh, apply it to our lives. See, what we can do is very easily we can read these chapters like a land registry document or like a legal document or the terms and conditions uh, of a certain item or, or issue. And we can just read through it. But actually, this was a significant moment for the Israelite people. This was a first First time moment. Think about it. These people have been for centuries in slavery in Egypt, working under the oppression of Pharaoh in Egypt. They're set free and they march to their promised land that God had said they could have, but because they were too afraid and too negative about the outcome of taking that land, they had to wander around a desert for a whole generation, 40 years, living in a tent, relying on manna from heaven and being guided by, um, by God through the the desert they had to live they didn't some of these people had never lived in a house before they lived in and out of a tent before they never started businesses they never knew what it was to live in peace and yet here comes the moment for a whole generation of Israelites where there was a future that looked tangible that they could settle down and build a life and what happened is uh, Joshua, he's, they reckon he was about 100 years old. He lived to 110. They reckon he was about 100 years old at this time. He gets up before the people with Eliezer, the high priest, and then the heads of the different tribes. And they stand up and they give the land by lot. Now, to do this is quite a, a, a it's all the way through the Bible, giving land by lot or give, making decisions by lot. And it's not like our lottery that's, you know, by chance something, you know, you might win it or not. But actually, this was uh, involving God. And they believed that as they chose by lot, God was the one who made it happen because he was sovereign over the decision. And, and the story goes, or tradition goes, uh, says that what Joshua did is he, he stood before the people with two earth vessels, two clay vessels. These are plastic plant pots, but you get the picture. And jo Joshua stood before the people with these vessels, and in one of them was the tribes of Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel, and in the other was the borders of the land that would be given. And so Joshua, a hundred years old, stands before the people and picks out from one vessel the name of the tribe and reads out that name. And then he picks from the other vessel and reads out what area they would live in. Just picture the moment. This is people standing with their families and wondering, I wonder where we'll live. I wonder what inheritance we'll be given. I wonder, will we be near the sea? Will we be in the mountains? Will we be able to farm the land? Will we have to raise livestock? What will it be like for us? This is an incredible moment for a whole generation of Israelites to be given something that they had never had before. Will we live in a city or in the countryside? What will it be like for us? This was a first time moment. And it was significant for the Israelites because it was a moment for expansion. The first time that they could expand and settle the land. 
Now, I know what you're thinking, what on earth has this got to do with my life? Do you know what is going on in the real world? You're talking about all these tribes and vessels and all that stuff, but I've got some real life issues here. Well, well, I want you to think about expansion, that idea of expansion, and I wonder what expansion in your life means to you. I wonder what it is that you're hoping will be different, will be better, will be bigger, will be changed. Whatever it is, whatever you're looking for expansion, then keep it in your mind this afternoon as we unpack the word of God uh, so that you can apply this to you. I don't know what it could be, whether it's growing in God or whether there's a promise that you want to walk in, whether it's pursuing a vision that God has given you, whether it is enlarging your business or your family or increasing your capacity, stepping out in some area, changing your job. Maybe it's overcoming some habits that have been dragging you back. Maybe there's sin in your life that you can't seem to get over. Or maybe there's a mindset that seems to just be stuck. And you would say, if that could be different, that would be brilliant. Well, that's what you're going to think about as we talk about expansion. I wonder, can we get the glass doors open and give everybody a bit of fresh air? That would be wonderful. Thank you. I'm always fascinated by what people do in their lives as a job. Uh, You know, people pursue their lives by doing different things. And apparently there's a group of people in the world that pursue their lives in the study of fleas. There are flea experts out there. And uh, you know a flea, those parasites that live on pets and animals. Uh, We had a cat growing up who was flea ridden and uh, we would always be on a battle to kill the fleas. Well, apparently there's very interesting people in the world that study these fleas. And fleas uh, apparently can jump extremely high. They can jump 13 inches, which when you take the body length, why would you measure a flea? But when you take the body length of a flea, they can jump 200 times the length of their body. If humans could do the same, we would be able to jump around 900 feet. An incredible feat that the fleas can do. And that's how they get from animal and animal and uh, all of that. Well, what flea experts do is they catch fleas in jars. Very interesting people. And they go around and catch them in jars. And what they do is, uh, obviously, if they just put it in a jar, it would jump straight out of the jar. And so what these flea experts do is they put a lid on the jar to restrict it from being able to jump out. They then wait three days. And for three days, they watch the flea's behavior in this jar. And what it starts to do is it jumps. Obviously, it wants to get out of the jar. So it jumps and bang, it hits the top. It hits the lid of the jar. It jumps again, bang, it hits the top. But then gradually, as the time goes on, it seems to hit the jar lid less and less until by day three, the flea is uh, consistently jumping and falling just short of the lid, jumping up and down but not hitting the lid, jumping up and down and up and down. Now, that's pretty clever, isn't it, for a flea to figure out if I jump that but no further, uh, I will um, not hurt myself. Well, here's the stupid thing about fleas, is that if you take the lid off of the jar, and this is what flea experts do, they take the lid off, the flea continues to jump just short of where the lid was. And so it continues to jump and doesn't go any higher and so remains captured in the jar. Along comes Mrs. Right For Me Flea and they have children together and the children, the offspring of these two fleas, uh, continue to jump the same height as their parents. They learn it. And these flea experts spend their life proving this and, and showing us that this is the truth. Now, I know that I need to win you on my side to be able to speak to you this afternoon, uh, but sometimes we can be like fleas. I don't know whether you've ever noticed that. Sometimes we live in the confines of a lid that isn't there. Because in Jesus, when you became a Christian, the lid of your life was taken off. You are promised an incredible inheritance by the word of God. When you became a Christian, God gave you so much. All of heaven's resources are now available to you to live an incredible life like you'd, like to, like you'd want to live. And uh, it's promised to you, and so Jesus has taken the lid off of your life, but how many of you know it's a journey for us to figure out that the lid has gone and we can jump further than we used to and live a more expansive life than we used to? See, there were some issues for the Israelites that they had to overcome in taking the land that was given to them. They had to occupy the occupiers. And that's the the big kind of thought that is going to frame um, these next few moments, to occupy the occupiers. See, the Israelites were given land to occupy, but there were some occupiers in there that they had to uh, deal with. And there's so many areas where we can expand our lives, but we often fail because we don't realize that the lid has been taken off of our lives. 
So back to the story as recorded in these nine chapters. The the 12 tribes are there and they gather before Joshua. Uh, Those of you that are interested, you know that uh, uh, Joseph, one of the sons of Israel, his tribe was split into two, named after his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, giving us 13 tribes. And then, but one of the tribes, Levi, that was the priestly uh, tribe, they weren't given land because they interceded on behalf of the people. They were supported by the people and so they weren't given land. Now, sorry if you're not a map person, you may fall asleep right now, Uh, but there is a map here, uh, just roughly showing, hopefully, just showing us where the land, these were the different tribes, this is modern day Israel, uh, or uh, this area is modern day Israel, and this is what it looked like back then when the tribes were given their land, we maybe come back to that, but there's the different tribes there, and the different areas that they were allotted. And what happens is a few of the tribes are given land. And if you want to fall asleep tonight, give me a call and I'll explain all about to you how that worked out. But some of them were given land and then it goes quiet. So it's, it's uh, three and a half tribes were allotted their land and then no more. The, the, the Bible goes silent on the allotment of the land. Until this moment in chapter 18, and it's a pivotal moment in the, in the book uh, where they're taking this land. Uh, because what happens is the Israelites move from a town called Gilgal, where they had been settled, and they go to a place called Shiloh. Now Shiloh, in its natural geography, was like an amphitheater. It had hills all around it, so people could gather and look down. And in the center of Shiloh, they set up the tabernacle, the worship center for the people. And so uh, actually for around 300 years, this remained the center of worship for the Israelite people. And as they're setting up the tabernacle and setting up their tents, Joshua notices something different about the Israelite people. He notices that they're a bit more downcast than they were before, a bit more despondent, a bit more weary than they have been before. And he realizes they've lost the fight. They've lost the willingness to go in and take the land that was theirs. And so Joshua gets up and he says these words, to them. It's in Joshua 18 verse 3. So Joshua said to the Israelites, how long will you wait? And this word wait literally means to be slack, to be laid back, to be lazy, to have, to have settled and sat back or to sit around. So Joshua saying to them, how long will you sit around before you begin to take possession of the land that the Lord, the God of your ancestors has given you? Joshua is trying to give them a kick and a shove into pursuing what God has in front of them. The land was theirs for the taking, but they had grown lazy and did not want to take the land anymore. And I wonder as we gather in this worship center, whether we need to hear the words of Joshua spoken to us, where he is saying to us, how long before you begin? How long are you going to wait? How long are you going to sit back and settle and put up with that stuff in your life? So whatever it is for you that you've maybe grown weary about or grown familiar with, I want you to think about that in your mind. Maybe you're weary in prayer or service or pursuing God or growing in God. Maybe there's a promise that you know is true, but you've stopped walking in it and claiming it over your life. Maybe there's a situation that you've been praying about and you've just thought, I'll just settle back and I know it probably won't change, so I'll sit back and not pray for change anymore. Maybe it's a habit that is holding you back. Maybe there's some sin in your life that you're consistently trying to overcome and you can't, and you've grown weary in taking possession of the future that God has for you, and you've settled like the flea in the jar, and God is saying to you, how long are you going to wait? Maybe it's a dream, and for years you thought you were going to pursue this dream, and yet you've come to this point and you thought, it's probably never going to happen. And so you sat back and you settled, and God wants to say to you today, how long are you going to sit back? How long are you going to wait? And here's the truth is as Christians, you know there is an enemy to our souls. The devil, Satan, is constantly working, trying to hold us back, keep us in the jar, stop us pursuing who God wants us to be. And actually, I think the devil sometimes is okay with us coming into church, sitting in the service, and leaving again. Leaving with the same issues, leaving with the same mindsets, and then coming next week, coming and sitting, having a nice time, saying hi to people, leaving, leaving the same. I think what really starts to get the the devil worked up and hot and 
under the collar is when we start living out this thing. And we start saying, God, you said to me on Sunday, and when they were singing that song, you spoke to me about that truth. I'm going to walk in that truth, and I'm going to believe it. That starts to get the devil bothered. You know, I think the devil will probably be okay if we stayed in this building and said, this is us for the next hundred years. We'll just stay in this building. But as we started talking about building a new building and taking some land in our city, I think that starts to get the devil a bit bothered because we start actually walking out and taking ch- territory in our lives and in this city. And, uh, but here's the deal. We don't need to worry about what the devil's going on about because actually he can't stop us. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. In James 4 verse 7 it says, resist the devil, and he doesn't just hold back or wait. It says when you resist the devil, he flees, he runs away from you. And so as you walk in your life, and as you walk out into the promises of God, yes, the devil will be there, but it's easy to overcome the devil, but he, because he can't stop us. But here's what the devil tries to do to stop us. He tries to distract us, and he tries to cause us to compromise. So that we don't just occupy, uh, so that we, as we walk into these new areas, we have to overcome these issues where we're not distracted and we don't compromise. See, the Israelites had the land. It was theirs for the taking. It was given to them, and they started to walk into that land, and then they realized, hang on a minute, there's people already in this land. There's some occupiers already here that we need to deal with. And so it is with us as we begin to walk into the promises of God and as we step out for the first time in God and we say whatever it is, whether it's a physical stepping out or uh, uh, trying to overcome some mindsets or overcome some habits in our lives or, or, or believing God for a promise, whatever it is for you as you begin stepping out into that, believe me, you'll find there's already some occupiers there that do not want you to go and take that ground in your life. And we have to listen and and realize the story of Joshua because they had an issue not just of occupation but of the occupiers. They had to deal with the occupiers that were already in their land. I don't know about you but many times I've been in church or read a book or heard a preach or I've been at a conference and I've been all fired up and thought, I'm going to occupy, I'm going to begin walking in that truth, walking in that promise, I'm going to overcome, I'm going to have it. And then suddenly, day one, I meet some obstacles or suddenly I think, oh, let's follow that instead and I'm distracted. And, and uh, I never do what I was so inspired and built up to do. And that's because occupiers try to distract us and stop us from being who God wants us to be. Uh, the definition of an occupier is somebody residing or using property as its owner or illegally a squatter who takes and occupies a building or it's someone who's moved into a space and taken control of it and how many times in my own mind and my own internal world do I think I want to move into this place and begin journeying with God here but suddenly I find there's already some occupiers there that have claimed that space for themselves and we need to deal with them so that we can occupy the space that God wants us to occupy. I remember being 18 years old, and I felt God had said to me to go to Bible college, and so I packed up my uh, Corsa with all of my life's possessions and went to Bible college and drove the four or five hours that it was to get there, and as I drove through the gates of the college, I thought, what on earth am I doing here? What have I done? I need to turn around and go back home. I remember as I, uh, the people came in and helped me unpack my car and put it into my room, I didn't unpack all of my boxes, just a couple of them uh, and a couple of bags because I thought there's no way that I'm staying in this place. I've met those people. They're far better Christians than I am. They know way more than the Bible than I do. They're from Christian families. Their moms and dads are pastors and church leaders and all of these things. And all of these thoughts started to flood my mind and I, I distinctly remember standing in my room thinking, I'll be going home next week. I've got a life that I can go back to because I do not belong here. I remember when we packed up another Corsa, moving here to Scotland from Nottingham, and me and Leanne, we sat in the car full of stuff, and it was our final journey to come and live here and move here four and a bit years ago. I remember driving on the motorway, and Leanne dropped the bomb question, uh, and she said to me, well, we never asked them at the church if they believe that women should be in ministry. We never checked that. 
And, and so then began a conversation, and of course we do hear, but we didn't know that time, and after kind of a, a year or so of conversation, we never thought to ask. And so then in the car, we started to ask all these, well, we never checked about that. Do they even like English people in Aberdeen? Do they allow bold people to? All of these questions started to fill our minds, and we thought, what are we doing? We've not even thought, uh, thought about this properly. We've not asked the questions that we were supposed to ask. Or what about when you wake up early and you say, you know, I'm going to do my devotional life with God. I'm going to get up early. I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to nail this. And you get up, you set your alarm, and you open your Bible, and then the children wake up, and they come through, and then they create havoc, and you've got CBBs on the background, and then they knock over your coffee, or the phone rings, or the postman comes, and suddenly you're distracted from walking in what God wants you to walk in. Maybe it's as you're trying to overcome some, some mind issues, and you're on that social media, and suddenly you're filled with insecurity, and you're looking at other people, and you're distracted from pursuing in the territory that God wants you to pursue in your life. So many times Occupy has come to distract us. Habits, time fillers, distractions, compromises, voices in our minds, future, things of the past that try to hold us back. There are occupiers that want to stop you taking the ground in your life that God wants you to take. And in these chapters, there are five uh, tribes detailed Details given of five tribes that did not deal with the occupiers in the land that they were given. And we're going to look at them very quickly because these occupiers were saying things to the Israelite people that I think occupiers say to us in our lives and we need to deal with them. The first one is in Joshua 15 verse 63. It talks about the tribe of Judah, that big tribe at the bottom. And they were given a large piece of land and yet it says they did not dislodge the Jebusites. Now the Jebusites were people that lived in Jebus, which is what we would today call Jerusalem, that area there. And they had occupied that land. And uh, it says that they could not shift them from that city. They could not get rid of them. Interestingly, just five chapters earlier, Joshua, when leading the people into battle, had defeated the king of Jebus. He'd already taken out that city. It was already the Israelites. And yet, five chapters later, they'd taken back the land. And this was the occupier that was saying to the Israelite people, you've tried this before. You've tried before. And sometimes we have occupiers in our minds and in our lives that say, don't bother trying that. You tried this before. It didn't work. We're back stronger. Don't bother again. The second one is Joshua 16, verse 10. Ephraim, the tribe of Ephraim, could not dislodge the Canaanites. And what they did was they made the Canaanites do forced labor for them. So rather than getting rid of them, they said, actually, you can stay here and live amongst us, but you're going to do forced labor for us. And this was the occupier that said, you need me. Don't get rid of us. Keep us here. You need me in your life to help you to be who you want to be. Because the, the Ephraimites were distracted by materialistic gain. They they thought, well, if we get them to work for us, we'll be more proster, uh, uh, prosperous and we'll be able to get more money in. And so they allowed the occupier to convince them that they needed them. And what happens is just one book later in the Bible, just in Judges, it describes how the Canaanites, the one who were doing forced labor for the Israelites, rose up against the Israelites and forced the Israelites to do forced labor for them. And if we don't deal with the occupier that says, you need me, and you, we allow it to exist, sure enough, one day we might wake up and find out that the occupier has control on our lives. If we allow that, that thought pattern, or we allow that sin habit, or we allow uh, that voice in our mind to just exist there and to be there or that issue from our past that we think we need because it, it makes us feel better about today and we don't deal with it, one day we might wake up and we realize that is actually in control of my life and we need to deal with occupiers so that we're able to walk forward and not have things that control us but only God and the Holy Spirit and we have a sound mind can control us and walk us in our journey. Joshua, the third one, Joshua 17 verse 12, Manasseh were not able to occupy the Canaanites for it says the Canaanites were determined to live in that region. This is the occupier that says, we will not be moved. And I don't know if you have some situation in your life that you just think no change can happen here. This is just so set. That person will never become a Christian. That marriage will never be healed. We'll never be able to achieve that. Whether we're stuck with things that we say it will always be like this. But let me tell you, in God, there's a different story that he has for your life because he is all-powerful and he works best in the impossible situations. 
And we dedicated Eden, who is a testimony of that, who God can work in impossible situations. Number four, Joshua 17. is an interesting one. The tribe of uh, Joseph, uh, Manasseh and Ephraim, these two tribes were given way more territory than any other tribe. They had a huge space of land. And they went to the leaders of the nation. They said, we need more land. There's too many people. We need to expand. And, uh, and they, the leader said, well, you can't expand. But what you can do is there's large swathes of your land that are forest. If you would just clear the forest, there would be more than enough room for you all to live in that uh, area that you've been allotted. And this is the, the occupier that says to us, you can't see me. You can't see us. We're hidden here. This is the blind spots in our lives, the incognito occupiers. We think that we want to expand our lives, but something is holding us back, and it wants to sit there. These trees, forgive me for a minute, but you know, these trees were kind of like, there's nothing to see here. No, nobody wants to come and live here. Don't notice us. You go and get land over there. And sometimes stuff in our life says to us, just ignore me. I'm not an issue. You don't need to deal with this in your life. You just go and focus on other things when actually... What it was doing was holding them back from expanding in other areas until they dealt with the issue in their own lives. And this is why we need people in our lives because blind spots, you can't see it, but who else can? Everybody else can see the blind spots in our lives. And this was why we invite people to say, is there areas in my life that I need to be dealing with and occupying that is being occupied by an occupier that I need to deal with? Number five is Joshua 19 verse 47. It describes how Dan had difficulty taking their land from the Amorites. So they went up to Leshem and named it Dan. Now this is a verse that we just skip over and take another sip of coffee and carry on. But this is a very, very sad verse in the allocation of the land. Can we just chuck up the map again? Sorry, non-map people. Uh, We're just going to see this map hopefully again. Great. Uh, You see here, just in the middle there, the purple, that's Dan. It's a small one just to the left, above Judah, below Ephraim. Dan was given this piece of land from when the lots were drawn. And this was a great piece of land. It had a very significant port, Joppa, on it. Those of you you know that's in the New Testament, the port of Joppa. It's written about a lot in the Bible. Great piece of land that they were given. It's next to Ephraim, Benjamin, Judah, right in the hub of the action. And Dan were given that land. But as they went to take that land, the occupiers in the land said to them, you're inadequate. You can't take this land. You're not strong enough. You're not good enough. You're not clever enough to live in this land. And what Dan did is they retreated and they hid. If you look at this map, and follow the black line of the river, Jordan, all the way up to the top. There's a little blue lake at the top there. Above that is Dan. And what the whole tribe of Dan did that were given all that land is they went up to the north, took one city called Leshem and renamed it Dan, and they all lived there. In comfort, in in insignificance, and in security, nestled between Naphtali and Manasseh, big tribes, and they hid away because they allowed the occupiers in their life to say, you're not good enough, you can't do it, and so they shrunk back. And I wonder if any of us have shrunken back and said, I'll just sit in my seat and be quiet, I'll not pursue that dream, I'll not be that person because I'm not good enough and I don't have what it takes to overcome that stuff in my life, to be who God wants me to be, and so we settle and we sit back, but God wants to tell us a different story because it's not about our ability or about our adequacy. It's about his ability and his adequacy to overcome everything in our lives. If we would just walk in the promises and in the inheritance that God has for us, we could live in incredible lands with incredible blessing in our lives if we would just overcome the statement that we are inadequate to live in that area. And what we need to do as we think about these occupiers is times them by 10 years. Take that habit and times it by 10 years. Take that mindset, times it by 10 years. Take that situation that you've stopped praying about and times it by 10 years. Take that that unfulfillment and walking into a dream that God has given you. Take it by 10 years. Where do you end up if you allow those occupiers to live in your life? Where will this lead you? God has given you and blessed you and promised you an expansive life, an inheritance beyond measure, and yet so often we stay like the flea in the jar and we don't walk into all that God has for us. So how do we, as we close How do we overcome these occupiers? Well, Joshua, when the first lot of tribes went to take their ground, he gave them six things to go and do. He didn't say, go into battle and go and make cities. He didn't give them a strategic plan of how they would do it. These are the six things that he said to them. Be careful that you keep the commandment and the law. Second, love the Lord your God. 
Third, walk in his ways. Fourth, obey his commands. Fifth, hold fast to him. And sixth, serve him with all your heart and soul. If we do these things, let me tell you, the occupiers in our lives, you'll find that they'll start to go away. As you hold fast to God, as you hold fast to his word, as you love him, as you serve him and serve his purposes, the occupiers will begin to shrink back and you'll find yourself looking back in 10 years time on an expansive life where you say, look where God has brought me. It's a promise for us in our lives. Why don't we bow our heads and close our eyes as we close today. Let's hear the words of Joshua. Why are we waiting anymore? The land is yours. Rise up, take ground, deal with the enemy occupiers in your life and occupy the future that God has for you. Lord, we pray, Holy Spirit, come. Lord, we can't do this on our own. Lord, we can't do it by our own ability, our own cleverness. Lord, we thank you that we live in 2017 when the Holy Spirit is available to us. That you're there to help us, to equip us, to guide us, to comfort us, to counsel us. So we pray, Holy Spirit, come into our lives. Lord, help us as we occupy new areas of our lives. As we seek to walk into new things in the promises and the inheritance that God has for us. Lord, we pray that you would help us, Holy Spirit. That you would guide us and lead us. That you would empower us to walk into all that we want to all that God wants us to be Lord we don't want to be like the fleas that are stuck in the jar stuck in habits stuck in mindsets but Lord we want to walk in the expansive life that you have for us Lord we pray that you would help it to help us to do it in Jesus name amen you know we finished a few minutes earlier than we normally do because we want to give you an opportunity And we'd love to pray with you. There's been many times in my life where I've had to break through something. And it's been by coming and having somebody put a hand on my shoulder and pray for me. And where I'm able to vocalize what I'm going through. And there'll be a team down here. We'll be down here at the front. We'd love to just stand with you and pray with you if there was something that spoke to you today. But the band are going to lead us. Here, come back tonight. We're going to be looking at the the life story of Caleb who's in these verses. An incredible man of God who an unsung hero in the Bible. So come back tonight at 6 as we continue with this series. But the band are going to lead us. If you need prayer, come forward for prayer. But let's stand together and worship as we close.